as a kid, I was really, really shy and awkward. Um, emphasis on the awkward. I didn't really know how to make friends, so I got teased a lot, um, mostly just for you know reading in class and being quiet, stuff like that. Um, so I didn't feel particularly close to anybody. In high school, the pattern of my childhood kind of just continued and got worse because in high school, you really have to get out there and try to make friends. Um, you know, you're in classes with different people and I would just sit by myself. Like I felt all this fear when I would be in classes where I didn't know anyone, which was a lot of the time. Uh, social anxiety disorder is another anxiety disorder. This is a problem where people um, feel anxious or frightened in social or performance uh, situations, public speaking, meeting new people, interviews, those sorts of situations. Anxiety can be such a difficult thing for people, especially the, the younger they are dealing with anxiety, the more difficult it is for them as they transition through life. Anxiety at every stage of life uh, is going to pose, it's going to rear its ugly head, let's put it that way. So that if, if someone is 18 and about to leave high school and go into university or get their first job or move out of home, those are things in life, life issues that are going to... Uh, exacerbate or, or change how someone's feeling. I felt like a loser constantly. I felt like people just didn't like me because of who I was innately as a person. I felt like I was boring and I didn't fit in with other people. And I just genuinely thought that I did not have the ability to interact with others normally. Um, and I did not like the thought that I had anxiety didn't even cross my mind. The main difference between kind of normal levels of fear and anxiety and, and anxiety that we would see at a level that we would, might call an anxiety disorder is, is the severity, so the intensity of it, um, but more importantly whether it interferes with somebody's life. I was excluded from my group of friends that I had been hanging out with since elementary school and I experienced a bullying situation. It was a very subtle, insidious form of bullying that kind of gnawed away at me day after day. And the fear of going to school really started to affect me and I would eat lunch in the library and sometimes, you know, like go, go to the bathroom and sit there for, you know, 15 minutes during class if, you know, I felt like things were getting too much because I still had classes with these people who I knew were talking about me behind my back. Um, so that was really difficult to deal with. I think a lot of people confuse anxiety with stress and, and just getting stressed out about something. And so um, a lot of people, when they, they hear about someone who's had a, a panic attack or, or they suffer from an anxiety disorder, they grasp at situations in their own life where they've, they've been anxious or they've been nervous or they've been scared or they've been uh, stressed. and say, oh, I can relate. Well, no, you can't. There, there's something that is, is beyond where, where you've been able to, you, you can tap into that. Eventually, it was recommended that I see a psychiatrist, and at that time I was evaluated and diagnosed with both depression and social anxiety. People with anxiety disorders often also experience problems with, um, with depression. Um, people with one anxiety disorder are more likely to have another anxiety disorder um, than, than not. We often see that kind of co-occurrence. Growing up I lived with both of my parents and my younger brother. Looking back now, like comparing myself to them, I feel like they might also have social anxiety a little bit, just like not diagnosable. Lots of different factors influence whether people experience anxiety and whether people develop anxiety disorders. So. Uh, one of those is certainly people's genetic makeup, their, their biology, the neurotransmitters in people's brains, um, the way people's brains function, uh, hormone levels, lots of different biological factors. Uh, in addition, we know that people's learning and, and experiences are very important. So um, parenting experiences, for example, can influence anxiety. We've had a, a few, more than a few parents, who will tell me that one of the things that really shifted for them when that they learned that their child had a mental illness was, you know, the child was causing them all this difficulty in the, in the home and elevating their stress levels. And when they under, start to, started to understand how, how hard it was on the child themselves, that's when they started to put their feet in, the other, in, their, child, in their children's shoes and were able to walk that walk and, and say, so much harder on them. I think that having a supportive family can make a world of difference. Um, in my situation, I think that my family would have been supportive if I had 
um, been more open with them from the very beginning, you know, from when I first started being bullied in high school, for example. So I would encourage others definitely open up to your parents, at least just try. Um, I'm currently in the process of trying to find treatment for it because even though I'm a lot better with it and it doesn't necessarily um, ruin my life anymore, I can manage it fairly well, I still think that, you know, if you can improve your life, why, why not do it? <laughs> people's expectations for treatment have an impact on outcomes, so that would influence what we would uh, recommend for that person. Uh, and then we would also think about the uh, sort of long-term versus short-term mm -hmm. benefits of a particular treatment. So for example, for a number of anxiety problems, medications work more quickly. So if somebody needs sort of a quick uh, uh, strategy for improving anxiety, that's an option. We also know that over the long term, for many anxiety problems, cognitive behavioral therapies are more effective. So once people stop all of their treatments, um, we see more relapse following ending medication than we do following the end of cognitive behavioral therapy, so that might be a factor as well. I started seeing a counselor. She kind of, she pointed out things to me that I already knew, but hadn't thought of as being important before. Um, like she pointed out the fact that, you know, thoughts are just things that go through your mind. You can choose to keep them there, let them go on by, and the healthy way to process negative thoughts is to just let them go um, rather than ruminating on them over and over again. I think she used the analogy of, you know, it's like cars on a freeway. Um, you know, you don't want them to get stuck in traffic in your head. <laughs> um, so it wasn't necessarily formal therapy, but it definitely had a lot of elements of cognitive behavioral therapy thrown in. Cognitive strategies involve teaching people to identify the thoughts that contribute to their anxiety, uh, number one. And number two, teaching people to shift their thinking, to be able to think more flexibly and to be able to think more realistically about the situations that they fear. But keep a daily inventory of some of the signs and symptoms that you've been exhibiting and where. What triggered them? What, were the, what, what caused those? And, and how did you get through it? So what were the coping skills that you used to get you through? And maybe your doctor and you will decide that those coping skills are actually they're fine and that, that you're, you're going to have some issues as you go through life but that it's not worth taking some of the medication that might be prescribed to you and maybe he's going to say we have to see a psychiatrist and here's who I'm recommending and this is who you're going to talk to keep journaling keep keep that keep track of that because they're going to want to know more and have more inter more in-depth questions um, and maybe he's going to be able to prescribe you something right there on the spot to get you through that period of time until you meet with the psychiatrist whole host of the what ifs the doctor's going to say, but own your part. Well, it's true that mental illness is not always visible. It's usually not visible, um, except in severe cases. And, um, but they are illnesses. Um, for me, with my anxiety, I think of it more um, as a condition, but it's a condition that I'm going to have all my life. It's something that I live with, um, similar to anyone else with a chronic condition. We see lots of different responses to treatment of anxiety disorders. It depends a little bit on the problem. So with specific phobias, most people are able to overcome the problem completely in a relatively short time. With some of the other more complex anxiety disorders, the most common response is a partial response, where people are much better uh, after going through some sort of treatment, but they still struggle with the problem from time to time. A small percentage of people are completely cured and never experience the symptoms of anxiety disorder again, and a small percentage of people get no benefit from treatment. Well, I think that everyone should be educated, at least in a basic way, in terms of what various mental illnesses are. I think the, vi the power of the video can go a long way in, in, in terms of shifting people's minds. I think people have to get a know that with someone with a mental illness, mental mental illness or mental health diagnosis, uh, is going to it, that it that their life is is going to be complicated by this, and and it's harder on them than it is on anyone else around them. The reality is, you can't get to everyone, and there are some people who just don't want to learn. Um, but I think that going forward, if we educate our kids about mental illness, they're going to grow up to be much more sensitive adults.